Animals strive to survive in the wild. They have complex agnostic behaviours that means they have to compete for resources and mates, as well as fight off the threat of a predator. We see what we expect to see in nature. We attribute human characteristics to animals in order to provide us with an explanation for their behaviours. Anthropomorphizing animals is a facet of human understanding. Anthropomorphism means attaching human characteristics to an animal or object. It can be traced through religion and beliefs which date back thousands of years ago. Shamanism is an ancient spiritual belief in nature and the earth. Shamanic practitioners believe that animals are spirit guides that help us to have balance in our lives. Symbolic representations of animals are made through totems and spirit cards. Each animal is attributed unique human characteristics that match the animal's behaviours, such as the dog. Dogs are viewed as guardians and protectors of humans, as well as being loyal, kind and trustworthy. This personification of animals is continued in many other religions, including Christianity. The use of storytelling in the Bible separates certain animals into positive and negative categories, such as the snake. The snake is used as a representation of the devil in the story of the Garden of Eden. It lays ground for our understanding of snakes as evil, manipulative, persuasive and sneaky. In modern day, if someone is called a snake, it is because they are disloyal. These representations of animals that have been present for a long time are manipulated by the media for entertainment. Attributing human characteristics to animals is common in TV, film and the internet. With the ever-growing use of technology in our day-to-day -day lives, it is becoming an influential part of how we perceive the world. I decided to investigate what the effects are of personifying animals through the distorted lens of the media. In order to do this, I first asked interviewees what their thoughts are on the influence of the media and if it is affecting our ideologies. Well, there are two or three things that have changed our relationship to animals historically. Industrialisation and urbanisation, particularly, have meant that we've become increasingly separated from animals in our day-to-day -day lives apart from in particularly controlled environments. So we don't see the lives of the animals that we eat, for example, but we do see animals that are our pets or in controlled situations like zoos. I think, you know, because we are trained from such a young age to use the TV as a babysitter, as a friend, as a comfort, it's so many different things. Um, we are learning how to not have human or alive interactions with people, with animals, with everything. I don't know how much we realise it's influencing them versus how much it's influencing people. Um, I mean, it's difficult because, you know, I've got a zoology degree and I have a massive interest in the subject, so obviously I read around it and I you know, take an active interest. But if you didn't read around or take an active interest, it's unlikely that you would know much beyond what's available in the media, really because you won't have learnt anything at school about it, that's for sure. So really, that is your information source. So actually, yes, it is hugely influential. The media can have a significant influence on people who have limited interactions with the natural world. I decided to look at two examples of films where there has been a noticeable change after the reaction of the audience. Jaws is a film about a shark who attacks swimmers at a beach resort. After the release of this horror, negative stigmas were attached to sharks in the news and a fear of sharks was created called galeophobia. We, we put a human emotion onto an animal's behaviour and turn the volume up and make it into a horror film. Which is fine, it's a form of entertainment, it's a horror film. But it's got nothing to do with nature or that animal. It's just a scary thing, scary thought. Um, if representing sharks, for example, as negative means that nobody cares about shark finning or that there are none left in the ocean and that everybody just wants them dead, then that, to me, is bad. The popularity of this film caused a fear of sharks that could be detrimental to the future of this species, as people are less likely to want to save an animal that they fear. 
Due to the representations of sharks in the media and exaggerated news articles, people perceive them as dangerous, vicious killers, even though they are harmless and do not purposely hurt humans. Free Willy is a film that was created in 1993. The anthropomorphised orcas as friendly, loving mammals and sparked the start of positive social action to be taken to save these whales. Twenty years after, a documentary called Blackfish was created that emphasised the harm of keeping whales in captivity. This film gained a lot of support from the public in campaigning against orca performances in SeaWorld. The film, which displays orcas as highly intelligent social creatures, caused much controversy online. With the help of social media websites such as Twitter and Facebook, Blackfish gained even more viewers and support. Um, I think until Blackfish and various campaigns, no one had really thought about dolphins and, and killer whales being kept in captivity and, and how you know, you're a creature that should be swimming for hundreds of miles is kept in a, in a, in a box, basically. Um, and that's been incredibly powerful and I think SeaWorld's on its last legs. I think we have to champion the potential role of the media in situations like that. But again, we have to be cautious, you know, so um, Blackfish got a lot of momentum behind it, a lot of social campaigning and political support, and it did actually make some changes in the way that orcas are treated. So th th those are really nice examples of where change can happen. But it's not just about the media, it's about what happens around the media and people being willing to campaign and support change. The film showed how the media can enable positive activism in saving certain species, rather than creating fear and controversy. Due to the public awareness of blackfish, 86% of travellers have now stated that they would not visit a marine mammal theme park. With the media playing a huge role in society, the world is becoming an ever-changing technological progress, with children spending more time online and less time interacting with the natural world. I wanted to investigate whether this could affect young people's notion of reality, and whether this can lead to a tendency for children to anthropomorphize in the natural world. I worry about my children because my whole family's in America, and we like talk to their grandparents on Skype. 90% of the time that's how they know their grandparents and then every now and again they see them in person and I think oh my god do they think all these other things they see on the screen are real like their grandparents you know what I mean like or do they just think their grandparents aren't real like everything else on the screen and you just don't know. Um, I think children are very clever at knowing what's real and what's not real I think we worry endlessly about them confusing reality with fiction but I still think that there's a sort of, uh, it's, a, it's a cultural assumption that's made about the kind of personality characteristics, whatever, of many different types of animals, which I think is dangerous. I think children will always find a way of making a distinction between what's real and what's not. I think what's important in terms of engagement with the media is that it can mean that children are not having day-to-day -day experiences with any kind of unmediated nature or natural setting and that can have all kinds of different effects um, but it does go back to the point about them not having any direct connection to non-human animals other than through the medium so they might well be able to make a distinction between reality and what's on the screen in terms of day-to-day -day life but then if they're not having that day-to-day -day contact then they're missing out in all sorts of ways that might have serious consequences for um, climate change and environmental threats in the future, if that relationship with nature is a basis for then caring about it and doing something about it. In 1999, James Serple proved in a study that children want pets for companionship due to anthropomorphism in toys, Disney films and TV. He also proved that parents will buy pets for their children in order to provide that companionship. This want and need for animal comradeship is the primary reason for the pet trade, which can be extremely harmful for exotic animals. If you look at Pinterest, it's full of pictures of cute baby animals torn away from their mothers. Usually the mother's been shot or beaten to death so they can take the baby, dress it up, uh, and then you know you can buy it as a pet. If you go to Mexico, there are drugged baby tigers that you can have photos of yourself cuddling the cute baby tiger who's not going to live very long, is it? Um, 
massive amount of pet trade with the slow lorises being dragged out of the jungles and um, orangutans, masses and masses of baby orangutans, their mothers are literally beaten to death to take the baby and then they're sold to mostly at the Arab states where they're very popular as pets until of course they're not cuddly anymore because it's too big and then I don't hate to think what happens to them then. There's this place called Clark's Village, um, which is in the next state up in the mountains. And they have these bears there that like do tricks for ice cream. And I remember being horrified about it as a kid. Like I was just like not OK with it. Like this is bad and wrong and weird. And but it was like actual like living animals in the real world that I watched this happen to. And it really bothered me. If you overrepresented something as being cute and cuddly, which meant that they were actually in danger of becoming extinct or that masses of them were dying because they have been taken for the pet trade when they're not actually suitable animals for pets and that's negative. Anthropomorphic representations of animals as being cute and cuddly can have harmful effects on our understanding of how to treat these animals. The pet trade can have negative consequences to animals in the natural world which are taken from the wild and domesticated for companionship in ways that are harmful to that animal. However, it is not all negative. Anthropomorphism, when used in the right way, can promote conservation and save certain species from becoming endangered or even extinct. More broadly, if there's an understanding of animals that understands them as more complex, if we're humanising animals, as it's sometimes referred to, then you could say that that's creating the basis for a more ethical relationship to non-human animals. We more like to care for them, empathise with them, treat them better. You could even say, if you're being optimistic, that that's a basis for conserving and caring for nature more generally as well. I mean, representing a, a polar bear as cuddly, if that's going to mean that people care about polar bears and global warming and blah, 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 I mean, that's all for the good. Media depicts animals through a distorted lens that perceives them as good or evil. Anthropomorphizing animals in this way can have both positive and negative effects. With the ever-growing reliance on technology, people are having less interactions with the natural world. Therefore, personifying animals in children's films could have negative consequences on how people treat animals and the environment in the future. So it's about humanity waking up and being conscious about their choices more than about saying, the media is feeding us this thing about animals, so how do we deal with that? Like, we don't have to be fed by the media. And I think that that's the choice we need to start looking at in society.